Before I get into the sermon this morning, let me let you in on a little secret. We have been using the lectionary now for more than 10 months. And even if it is still fairly new to you, you probably know by now that the lectionary is a plan for reading through most of the Bible in public worship over a three-year period. You probably know that for each Sunday there is a reading, one from the Old Testament, one from the Psalms, one from the Gospels, and one from the Epistles. But you may not know this, that the three-year lectionary cycle is divided up into year A, year B, and year C. And each year has its own gospel emphasis. Year A, for example, is Matthew's year. Year B, the one we're in now, belongs to Mark. Year C is devoted almost entirely to the Gospel of Luke. Wait just a minute, you say. What about John? What about the beloved Gospel of the beloved disciple? When do we get to hear that? Well, here's the secret. Readings from the Gospel of John, about 70 of them all together, are mixed into those other three years like chocolate chips into a batch of cookie dough. And today's reading from John chapter 2 is one of those chocolate chips. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. I want you to let those words sink in just a little bit. I want you to let them register on your brain. People were in the temple selling cattle. People in the temple selling cattle. Just imagine what it would be like to come up the front steps of Richmond's First Baptist Church to push your way through those impressive doors and to find out there in the narthex sheep, cattle, doves, and money changers all crowded into that space to hear the sounds of cattle lowing, sheep bleating, doves cooing, coins clinking, to smell the smells that would be in the air, the warm breath of cows, the wet wool of sheep, the unmistakable aroma of fresh manure. If you were to push your way through that menagerie and past those money changers and come into a sanctuary where you had hoped to worship Almighty God, if you had been a member here for a while, and even if you hadn't, you might feel your sense of propriety offended. And if you were bold enough, you might say, as Jesus said, get those things out of here. I don't remember everything he said, but I do remember hearing my former pastor, Paul Duke, preach on this passage. And the images that he used were unforgettable. He said, think about the temple, that stone wall and those heavy wooden doors suddenly thrown open. And a money box sailing out end over end until it exploded on those stone steps and coins went scattering everywhere. Think about the sheep and cattle coming out through those same doors in a frantic stampede, their eyeballs rolling in their sockets wildly, doves beating the air with their wings, flying away in every direction. And then the money changers coming out, covering their heads with their arms and their hands as Jesus comes behind them, brandishing this whip of cords, this lunatic, this maniac shouting after them, Stop making my father's house into a marketplace. Who is this guy? What happened to the Jesus whose picture used to hang on the wall of my Sunday school classroom? The one with the soft brown curls and the limpid blue eyes. Where is he? Who is this? Shouting after the money changers. Why is he so angry? I'll tell you why. Because somebody had turned his father's house into something it was never meant to be. It reminds me of the story of Martin Luther, the man who started the Protestant Reformation. When he was a boy, he was terrified of hell. He had seen this picture of Jesus the judge 
seated on a rainbow before all those people who had been raised from the dead who were now standing before him. To some of them, he said, Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. But to others, he said, Depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Young Martin Luther looked at that picture, saw the demons dragging the dead by the hair of their head off to the fires of hell, and always he thought, when judgment day comes, I will be one of those. Those fears followed him all through his childhood and youth, and one day, on his way back to the university in the middle of the summer of 1505, he got caught up in a thunderstorm and a bolt of lightning knocked him to the ground. Terrified, he cried out, Saint Anne, help me, I will become a monk. And he did. And for a while, it put his fears of hell to rest. But eventually, they caught up with him again. And when he was asked to fast for one day, he fasted for three days, thinking that would put him in good stead with the Savior. On cold winter nights, he would kick off his covers and lie shivering there on the bunk in his monk's cell, mortifying his flesh for the sake of his faith. He would confess every sin he could think of, and on the way back to his bunk from the confession booth, think of one more and go running back. Finally, his mentor at the monastery said, Martin, Martin, you are wearing me out with all this unnecessary penance. Get your doctorate. Study the scriptures. Maybe you can cure yourself by teaching others. And so this is what Martin Luther did. He began to study the Bible as he had never studied it before. He learned that in the Greek language, that word that had been so terrifying to him, the word justice, could also mean to justify, to make someone right in the sight of God. Not only a word about damning people to hell, but about saving people for heaven. That this was God's intention from the beginning. Not that everyone should end up in eternal torment, but that they should all end up with him in paradise. Martin Luther said, I felt myself to have been reborn and gone through open doors. The whole of Scripture took on new meaning for me. And whereas before the justice of God had filled me with dread, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. This passage from Paul's letter to the Romans had become for me a gate to heaven. Martin Luther, released once and for all from his fear of hell, anticipating only heaven, learned that the Roman church was selling indulgences. These fancy certificates with the Pope's own seal on them, which promised to release people from their sins and to release their relatives from purgatory. The sellers of indulgences would say, when a coin in the coffer clings, a soul from purgatory springs. Some of Martin Luther's own parishioners were emptying their pockets to buy the release of their friends and family members, and it made Martin Luther furious. Because the Pope of the Roman Church could not forgive sins, only God could forgive sins. And Martin finally understood that. And so on Halloween, 1517, Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church inviting debate on the sale of these indulgences. He didn't mean to do it. But with that action, he started the Protestant Reformation. 